eight. The commission consisted of an equal number of senators and representatives, but these members of Congress were mere window dressing to the advisers and staff who did the real work of the commission. From the beginning, Aldrich envisioned the NMC and the banking reform movement generally to be run as an alliance of Rockefeller, Morgan, and Kuhn Loeb people. Aldrich chose as the leading experts advising or joining the commission two men suggested by Morgan leaders. As his top advisor, Aldrich chose, on the suggestion of J.P. Morgan, seconded by Jacob Schiff, probably the most powerful of the Morgan partners, Henry P. Davison. For leading technical economic expert and director of research, Aldrich accepted the recommendation of Roosevelt's close friend and fellow Morgan man, Harvard University President Charles Eliot, who had urged the appointment of Harvard economist Abram Piet Andrew. Andrew commissioned and supervised numerous reports and studies on all relevant aspects of banking and finance. In December, Aldrich hired the inevitable Charles A. Conant for research, public relations, and agitprop for the NMC. Meanwhile, Aldrich gathered around him inner circles of influential advisors who included Warburg and Vanderlip. Warburg gathered around him sub-circles who included Irving T. Bush, head of the Currency Committee of the New York Merchants Association, and men from the top ranks of the American Economic Association, to which Warburg delivered an address advocating central banking in December 1908. Warburg met and corresponded frequently with leading academic economists who favored banking reform, including Seligman. Davis R. Dewey, historian of banking at MIT, longtime secretary-treasurer of the American Economic Association and brother of the progressive philosopher and educator John Dewey, Frank W. Tosick, Irving Fisher of Yale, and Oliver M. W. Sprague, professor of banking at Harvard of the Morgan-oriented Sprague family. In the month of September 1909, the reformers accelerated their drive for a central bank into high gear, Morgan-oriented Chicago banker George M. Reynolds delivered a presidential address to the American Bankers Association, flatly calling for a central bank for America. Almost simultaneously, on September 14, President William Howard Taft, speaking in Boston, suggested that the country seriously consider a central bank. Taft had been close to the reformers, especially to his Rockefeller-oriented friend Nelson Aldrich, since 1900. The Wall Street Journal understood the importance of this public address as removing the subject from the realm of theory to that of practical politics. One week later, the bank reformers organized a virtual government bank media complex to drive through a central bank. On September 22nd, the Wall Street Journal began an unprecedented front-page 14-part series of editorials entitled A Central Bank of Issue. These unsigned editorials were actually written by the ubiquitous Charles A. Conant. From his vantage point as salaried chief propagandist of the U.S. government's National Monetary Commission. Building on his experience in 1898, Conant, aided by Aldrich's secretary, prepared abstracts of commission materials and distributed them to newspapers in early 1910. J.P. Gavitt, head of the Washington Bureau of the Associated Press, was recruited by the NMC to extract newsy paragraphs for newspaper editors out of commission abstracts, articles, and forthcoming books and two ostensibly disinterested academic organizations lent their coloration to the NMC. The Academy of Political Science, publishing a special volume of its Proceedings in collaboration with the NMC to popularize in the best sense some of the valuable work of the Commission. In the meanwhile, the Academy of Political and Social Science published its own special volume in 1910, Banking Problems, 
introduced by Andrew, and including articles by veteran bank reformers, including Johnson, Horace White, and Morgan Bankers Trust official Fred I. Kent, as well as by a number of high officials of Rockefeller's National City Bank of New York. Meanwhile, Paul M. Warburg capped his lengthy and intensive campaign for a central bank in a famous speech to the New York YMCA on March 23, 1910, on a United Reserve Bank for the United States. Warburg outlined the structure of his beloved German Reichsbank, but he was careful to allay the fears of Wall Street by insisting that the central bank would not be controlled by Wall Street or any monopolistic interest. Therefore, Warburg insisted that the new reserve bank must not be called a central bank and that the reserve bank's governing board be chosen by government officials, merchants, and bankers. Bankers, of course, were to dominate the selections. One of the great cheerleaders for the Warburg plan and the man who introduced the volume on banking reform featuring Warburg's speech and published by the Academy of Political Science, H.R. Mossy, editor, The Reform of the Currency, New York, 1911, was Kinsman and Seligman Investment Banking Family Economist E.R.A. Seligman. So delighted, too, with Warburg's speech was the Merchants Association of New York that it distributed 30,000 copies of the speech during the spring of 1910. Warburg had carefully paved the way for this action by the Merchants Association by regularly meeting with the Currency Committee of the Merchants Association since the fall of 1908. Warburg's efforts were aided by the fact that the resident expert for that committee was Joseph French Johnson. During the same spring of 1910, the NMC's numerous research volumes on various aspects of banking poured forth onto the market. The object was to swamp public opinion with a parade of impressive analytic and historical scholarship, all allegedly scientific and value-free, but all designed to further the agenda of a central bank. 